like how, especially in the last couple years, you know, not mm-hmm. that you obviously, and this is something, it's not like, I know you well enough that you weren't like, oh, COVID, now let's start focusing on this. This is like, but <laughs> especially the last couple of years, like, what does that look like? What, what do you mean by that when you yeah. consider that? Well, I love that you just mentioned real quick. So what, what I'm doing now is not that much different than what I was doing, mm. you know. The, so here's the fun fact. Six years, three before the pandemic, three technically in the pandemic, right? So that perspective, I think, is I reflect on that constantly. Before the pandemic started, I'd already talked to my staff about, um, you know, dare I say this because some, some will roll their eyes, but self-care. Right. And 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 I said this and it's not a buzzword. It's not a buzzword on my campus. It truly means something. And I've been very adamant of and it means something different to every single one. My self-care is not your self-care. Right. And and so forth. So I always encourage myself, whatever it is, whatever brings you that peace, whatever calms you down, whatever de-stresses and, you know, how you decompress, do that. Mm -hmm. intentionally and as often as you can. So we were already operating in that manner. I had, I would put out Google forms. I got this idea from a colleague and it's just like a check-in, like, hey, how are things going on a scale of one to 10? Here's where I'm at. Mm -hmm. This is something that I'm super proud of. I went, you know, and my staff be like, I went jogging for the first time and you know, this, no, great, awesome. So I was constantly checking in with them. I was modeling that myself. I was, you know, I know you got a wonderful fitness journey, but mm-hmm. I was on a fitness journey. I was doing, you know, going to the gym and and really working on my eating habits and and modeling that piece. And I always yeah. said family first. So when my older two weren't on my campus and they had a field trip, I would take a day off and go on the right. field trip with them because I'm a mom first. Mm-hmm. And I would have staff say, wow, you really get it. Like, thank you for modeling that. I don't feel guilty now because I'm taking care of my mother who's sick and I have to take a day. Like, no, why, why do we make teachers feel guilty for taking care of their own? I just don't understand that. But so all of that continued with like a hyper intensity in the past two years. right? Right. I mean, we literally just hit our two year anniversary of we left school one day, never knowing we were coming back to that in that manner, the rest of the school year. Um, Mm -hmm. So those Google forms, um, those first couple of weeks of the pandemic shutdown, when we weren't in our buildings, we were on Zoom with our students. I was sending a weekly Google form, like, what do you need help with right now? What technology can we support you with? Like, what are you doing for yourself? Um, And, you know, and getting that feedback. Now, here's the trick to those, though. When you get those responses, you got to respond back. Um, And I think that's where some administrators stop. They're just getting all that. No, this teacher just poured their heart and soul out. If I don't acknowledge that, what am I telling them? What's the value of them sharing that with me? So, you know, in that sense, that psychological safety, I think, is really important. And I and I hope and I feel like I provided that for them. Now, whether you become an entrepreneur in terms of opening a business, you should become an an entrepreneur and understanding that you are a business of one. And what do I mean by that is, Mm -hmm. let's say, let's say you're an educator. You go to your district and you soak up every piece of PD they offer. If it's letters training, if it's order getting ham, if it's schoology, if it's cams, whatever, you soak it up and you take those skills, you make them applicable to what you're doing and you put them aside in your toolkit, right? You are a business of one. And when your district no longer serves you, right, don't be afraid to leave and go somewhere else and you take those skills that you've learned from them for free somewhere else. Now, whether that becomes you starting your own consulting company you're going to go work for Canvas as, as a, a trainer for them. Uh, or you just, move again, move on to another school district where their values more align with yours or where, where you can see a, 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 a clearer path for growth for yourself. You do that. But we have educators as well as other workers who languish in jobs. Right. Because they get attached to the job. They get attached to the paycheck and not understanding as a business of one you actually are in control of where you go. 
right. because your employer will let you go when it is best suited for them. Right. Yep. Or yep. if, for example, a school district, which, you know, normally we don't, you know, school districts normally are not the places where you hear about a lot of uh, job cuts. However, when budget cuts come, you could be the one on the chopping block because they don't have the money for your salary. Life is really, really right. challenging. And it doesn't matter if you're, you know, a teacher who's been in the game for 15 years and you're struggling, it's really hard. Or you're an 11 year old who's really trying to like struggle right. with executive functioning, but you couldn't spell executive functioning and you have no idea even what that is. Right. Or you're somebody who's dealing with, you know, hard physical challenges, you know, uh, limitations to your body, right. your family's in hard straits, whatever it is. I never want to blame anybody for being in a tough spot, but I deeply believe that one of the most important powers we have is the ability to reframe what we're going mm -hmm. through and say, you know what, there are some things I can do. And, you know, so the light I have, and, you know, and, and I try to share with people because like you, I think maybe this is a projection. I don't know if it is George, but like, when people call me out for being kind or positive, I'm like, listen, man, I got plenty of darkness. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not here. I'm not here to pretend that everything's, as you said, right. sunshine and rainbows in our right. other podcast. What I'm trying to say here is there's sunshine and rainbows. There's also rainstorms and earthquakes, but you know what? Don't forget that there is actually sunshine, man. And there are actual rainbows right. and, and, right. and you can also make that sunshine and be those rainbows. And, and I don't just mean for other people, for yourself. So, I mean, th the message I have for people is I hear where you are. I respect it. And, you know, if you're tapping out or if you need to dip, I'm not going to yell at you. I'm not going to judge you. But I also want to say, as I said at the top of this episode, um, you are in one of the most powerful positions in the history of the world as a teacher. Right. Right. No, you might not be well known. There's nobody walking around with like, you know, your name on the back of their jersey. There's not a poster of you, although there should be probably a poster right. of you holding a piece of chalk in somebody's room. But you are literally going to be talked about forever mm -hmm. by hundreds, if not thousands of people. And dude, that's just like that's something and feel that, you know, and and think mm -hmm. about what you can do with it. Yeah. You know, when you're when you're talking about this, you know, the 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 big catchphrase of toxic positivity and all that stuff. And you probably, mm. heard, I'm sure you've heard that quite a bit. Right. Uh, totally. And I, you know, I've been like, Oh, you're just like, I, I, I don't think I'm a overly positive person to be honest with you. I'm a very solution focused person. Like, mm. I'm like hey, this sucks. I got, but I got to figure it out. Right. And I don't swear usually, but yeah, I actually, that was my first swear. First swear. <laughs> let's go so anyways yeah like i i um i i i i know this is and i i think you said something that really connected with me if i don't try to figure out a solution if i don't try to find a way forward the the dark for me will get worse and mm -hmm. i'll get and i can get in a really bad hole and like you know i've dealt with depression for years and stuff like that too and i think a lot of times i understand why people are like hey like you know, your positivity is not helping this stuff. Okay. Like then mute me, do whatever, but this is what I need to get through right now. This is what I need to kind of get through some of the stuff that I'm going through in that space. Mm -hmm. and, it, and like, uh, there's a really great quote from Mark and angel and I've shared it a million times. It's not like, and it's something paraphrased along the lines of like, it's not about ignoring the negative. It's about finding solutions. I obviously talk about innovation. People know it's the podcast is literally called the innovators mindset. Yeah. And I think sometimes like words like innovation, collaboration, they become buzzwords. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And what I mean by when I, when I say buzzwords, right. I mean that people say them without actually, they just say them without thinking about what they even mean. Yeah. Right. We say them because we feel we should say them. It's mm -hmm. like synergy. Right. Like we yeah. need, like, it's like a word that, what does it even mean and why are you saying it? Right. And so like, when you look at that, for, for example, when you talk about the notion of collaborative response or even the term collaboration, yeah. like, what, what does that mean to you? What does it look like? And, and why is it like so important to education? You know, I'm so interested that you asked that George, because that school in Claire's home, if you would have come in and said, so do you collaborate here? Everyone would have said, oh, yeah, yeah we collaborate right. all the time. But what they meant was we share and we get along really well. Um, when we talk about collaboration, I, I like to talk about it as having a little bit of tension or discomfort that comes right. with it. That when we're truly collaborating, we have norms that are established that give us some ground rules to interact. But then real collaboration is when we push just mm -hmm. a little bit. We challenge and we... 
we do it in a way that's all about honoring and building upon the strengths of each other. But you and I can can disagree within right. this. And we have norms or ground rules that allow us that, you know, we can debate hard on topics while still really enjoying the person themselves. And to do that well, you need, or we would argue, you need structures and processes and practice. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think our, our education system does a, a super job at really providing us experiences and tools to really collaborate well. I know when I was teaching at the university, that wasn't something I was really helping prep um, right. pre-service teachers with. So it's, um, when we say collaboration, we we mean a, a, a process that can have um, tension and discomfort, but it's coming from a place that it makes every one of us stronger and truly makes the some greater than than the or what is it the whole greater than the sum of the parts right? you know george the other part of that is the origins of of where we actually started and and really origins in education is that really it has been an isolated profession Absolutely. and that every teacher has their own classroom responsible for a certain group of students mm -hmm. Uh, responsible for their success and ensuring that they don't fail. So it really has been an isolated profession all along. Knowing that in every single one of those classrooms who are just side by side, we often haven't really accessed that um, true collaborative processes where we can bring those people together and, as Curtis said, really engage in an effective way that really impacts students. Um, one of the things I've been talking about quite a bit lately, and I'd love your perspective on this. Uh, I have really struggled with uh, actually my own TEDx talk. I, I was, I think in 2013, I, uh, I talked about the importance of sharing our voice. And you mentioned that too. And I think we've gone to such an, such a swing of the pendulum where it was like, nobody was sharing what they're doing. And now everybody's sharing what they're doing that I find nobody's listening to one another, that nobody's actually, you know, just paying attention or, you know, and it's like, we're, we're talking, uh, we're listening so we can then interject our ideas. Right. And like, maybe that's part of a podcast, I guess. Right. Cause you know, there, there, I guess there's a time and place for that, but how do you find that, that space where we teach kids, not just to use their voice, but to listen to the voice of others? Yeah. You know, this is another one where I feel like here's a simple idea, but mm -hmm. I feel like we can really get that conversation going. So one of the things that I've observed, um, I love using Flipgrid for students to present and for that to really be an interactive conversation. And I think that a lot of times people even forget the power mm -hmm. of Flipgrid for that threaded conversation. But my simple idea here is like presentations that happen in the classroom tend to be very one directional. So getting everybody to stand up in the front of the room and give their presentation usually takes a couple of class days um, to get through everybody. And, you know, that person has time to answer some questions. Usually that's a presentation format. You present something, there's a little Q&A at the end. Um, what you tend to observe is that as the presentations go on longer, people ask less questions, students get a little right. bit tired of, of hearing all the presentations. Um, now, I know some people are probably listening and they're like, okay, having people stand up in the front of the room and present is a really powerful skill. I'm not gonna disagree with you. I think yeah. this is something that should happen definitely in every classroom. But my thing here is like, how do we give multiple platforms and ways to assess students at different times? All right, so let's transition this to saying that instead of an in the front of the classroom, in front of the board, everybody goes up and talks, then we make them flip grid presentations. Everybody records a presentation and then it all gets posted on this grid, this flip grid. And then everybody, instead of at being required to listen to every single one, maybe you say, all right, everybody's going to listen to three different ones. Now you're giving students choice of which mm -hmm. topics they want to choose. So maybe they are really drawn to one of the subjects and now they're able to really listen to that. 
and they are required to give video feedback to that student who had presented. So they're engaging with it, they're talking through it, and they're required to, if they have to watch three of them, give three meaningful responses. And they're being assessed in a way on that critique that they're able to give or that thought. So in this way, first of all, you're giving those students who might present better on a flip grid, maybe it's because they want to write out a script and they're reading it as they're recording. Maybe it's because they're creative on video and they're going to add in all these cool elements that you would never even know and see about the student. So you're giving them the opportunity when they're presenting. And then when you're doing the, you know, the sharing out and students are learning from one another, you're giving them more choice as to which ones they engage with. And again, an opportunity to learn about like, oh, what are your mm -hmm. students choosing? Um, what are they really interested in? And, um, and you're still really, you know, giving that conversational piece. And I think it can be more powerful in ways. Mm -hmm. I, lo I love that because it is that is like embedded listening into the process and and like learning to respond and connect right like I remember um, years ago we we actually did this thing called digital parent volunteers and so parents that wanted to volunteer in their kids classroom that couldn't physically be there they would actually uh, respond to comments on blogs um, yeah. or they would respond to blogs and they write comments right and so one of the things that we did with the parents which was really cool was we made them take a, like a little short course before they were allowed to to be the digital parent volunteer. And they actually had to learn to write comments to encourage. So you couldn't just say, Hey, great job. It's like, what do kids say to that? So it was like, how do you actually, you know, uh, respond to something uh, and then, you know, get more information of the, the students so that they can actually respond more. So it wasn't just you would respond to your kid's blog, you were responding to, and kids were excited about that. And then the kids would learn to respond back and kind of go back and forth. A lot of times when we were talking, when I was talking about this idea of authority, you know, kind of making uh, an impact, I do know that that makes an impact early, right? But but later, people that wears off, and then they want to see what you're going to actually do. And there there is this. Uh, I used to teach this like Covey workshop thing. And I remember this one distinct example it was really powerful. Um, this this new um, principal, she came into a, a new school. They had a lot of trouble, a lot of issues, a lot of behavioral things going on, and. They, the school is like, it was like, a, it was like a nice little video. I'm sure it's true. Um, cause it was based on someone, but it was like, there was no pride in the school. Right. And like, everything was gross, blah, blah, blah. And so she went into this bathroom and she said, Hey, like, how come there's like the bathroom stinks. There's literally, and they're like, well, there's actually like urine, like caked into the floor and we can't get it out. Right. And we've tried blah, blah, blah. So she actually like went in the bathroom and got it out. And it was like, okay, like we got to pick it up. Like if this is the principal doing this, then it says something. And I, I always remember that story because that was such a powerful example to see how she, she did this and like the tone that it set. Because I think a lot of times um, teachers look at a, a, an administrator who is really good at delegating uh, stuff, but won't do anything themselves. And then they're like, that wears off. Do you know what I mean? And oh, it's not like finding their strengths. Yeah. It's, it's like, yeah, I don't want to do that. Yes. Right. No, I totally agree. Yeah. I, like, and how do you, like, how do you, how do you model that? Like what, how do you do that in your role? I, I'm not willing to get my hand or I'm not uh, unwilling to get my hands dirty in any situation. I will do whatever it takes. I thought that was going in a different way. You're like, Oh <laughs> yeah. I know. It's like, well, yeah, there's, there, uh, there's a, there's a, there's a year, that, year in line for me. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm never, I've never been afraid to just jump right in and right. where I can. Even uh, this morning, we um, had a standardized assessment we were giving students and we realized some of the testing tickets were wrong. Mm -hmm. I have no problem jumping right in and saying, what do I need to do? I'll print, I'll cut, I'll do anything, right. you know, for us to come together and just make this happen. And that's just who I am as a person. I, I've always right. felt like leading by example is, the best way we can lead, whether you're in a school or beyond, it doesn't matter. People are going to pick up on what you do more than what you say. So I can, and this comes from watching my father my entire life. He wasn't a man who was going to woo you with words, right. but you just watched him on a daily basis. And he said, man, this guy's a leader. Right. And I had friends my whole life going, your dad is, there's just something about him. He's really awesome. What did All your dad do? 
What did my dad do? He was uh, an insurance agent. <laughs> oh, wow. That's so cool. But he, you know, he coached um, growing up. He coached a lot and just people gravitated toward him, towards him. And I truly believe it's because he led by example. And that was mm -hmm. my first exposure to, okay, if I'm going to lead, I got to lead by example first and foremost before anything else. Yeah. And like, like when I talked to you, I talked to Dr. Beelan. So like you're, you're, by the way, your district is blessed to have both of you, which is pretty Thank incredible. You. Thank you. Like both in the same district. That's yeah. amazing. Um, and really kind of thinking about that. You, you both remind me of some of the qualities when I was kind of interesting that you said about your dad of my, my father and my mom really? and they owned a restaurant and they were just kind of like, like they were just with everybody, right? It was like, they made everyone feel welcome. Like I remember my dad coming out. It was like, he kind of like sat <laughs> up when he came out, you know, cause it, it was just, it was just interesting. And I, I feel there's like that, that component of what my parents did in a restaurant was something that was like totally in me um, when I r ran a school and I didn't really realize it. Like, it's just kind of, you just, but sometimes that like it's, modeling leads to osmosis right like that it just kind of like seeps into you that you just kind of take on the characteristics of that and i noticed you know the more i stood outside in the morning greeting kids the more staff started greeting kids outside their hallways right